all with the hopes of getting to space. And when he got out of Harvard, he realizes, and he went to medical school there, never with any intention of becoming a practicing physician, but instead to further his chances of getting into the astronaut corps. Um, but when he gets out of school, he looks around and he realizes, he talks with astronauts, and he realizes that his chances of getting into the astronaut corps are slim. His chances of, if he were to get into the astronaut corps, are even slimmer in terms of flying. So this is when um, we're going to invite, we're going to have Eric Toth and Mike Melville. And these individuals are remarkable human beings who came together and figured out a way to make history. And they combine, you know, this great perseverance, grit, determination, ingenuity, and bravery. This man to my right is incredibly brave. Both men are. And what they went through to make this all happen is, um, is, 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 is this combination, again, of human bravery and great ingenuity and just persistence. So Peter Diamandis, he realizes that he's never going to get into the astronaut corps, so he has to create a private path to space. So this is where Eric Lindbergh's story comes in. Peter is reading The Spirit of St. Louis, which was the book that was written by Eric Lindbergh's grandfather, Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh, of course, was the first to fly nonstop, non-refueled from um, New York to Paris. When he landed in 1927, he arguably became the most famous man on Earth. And not only that, more importantly, he jump-started the commercial airline industry. So Peter is reading The Spirit of St. Louis, and he's like, wow, I always thought that Charles Lindbergh flew as a stunt, or maybe a dare. I didn't know that he flew to win a $25,000 incentive prize. It was called the Orteg Prize. And so he thought, what if, that was his kind of aha moment, he thought, what if I launch an incentive prize to jumpstart what didn't exist, which was commercial space travel. So he launches it, he announces it in May 1996 in St. Louis, where Charles Lindbergh also found his backers. And he had 20 astronauts on stage with him, including Buzz Aldrin, and Eric was there. Um, and he had the head of the FAA and the head of NASA. And he announces this $10 million prize. Minor, minor detail, he didn't have the $10 million, But uh, he was sure that he could get it. He thought it would be easy to get the $10 million and difficult to get the teams. And it proved just the opposite. So, but, but May 1996, this is when... You know, people hear about the X Prize and they start getting involved. So, Eric was approached by Peter in what year was that? Do you remember? 1995. 1995. So, a year before this announcement was made. And, you know, he wanted, because of what Eric's grandfather had accomplished, he wanted to um, get the Lindbergh family involved in this dream of his, this fantastical dream. So tell us about meeting with Peter. When you first met with him and, and what, you, what you thought and what he said. Yeah, so uh, maybe it's better if I start at the beginning. Um, I grew up a very you know, physically active kid in the Lindbergh family and in my family um, I'd say grandfather and grandmother perhaps were the most famous people on the planet for about 10 years straight according to the biographer Scott Berg um, and so I grew up very physical but with this this you know sort of let's say a barrier towards becoming uh, a pilot because of that fame, it cost my grandparents their firstborn son, and that, you know, sort of um, putting yourself out into the public was um, harmful to your quality of life, and that worked its way down through the generation. So, very physical, I was water skiing, climbing mountains, skiing, um, and when I turned 21, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, so I had this, I was disabled. 
And by age 30, I could barely walk with a cane. That's when I met uh, Peter DeMantis and, and astronaut Byron Lichtenberg. And they took me out to dinner. And I thought, well, it'll be a free dinner at least. <laughs> I, I wasn't really able to work at that time. My sense of, that physical sense of self was pretty well destroyed. Um, and the Lindbergh barrier, the Lindberghophobia, I called it, um, putting yourself out in the public eye was too strong to really step out and do anything uh, like that. But both Peter and Byron got me to think about traveling into space and this idea that looking back at our planet and seeing everything that we know and love and depend upon to survive is down here on this fragile blue ball. And that that changes the astronauts that see it and how worthwhile would it be to bring humanity um, that vision to help us, you know, this sustainable spaceship, spaceship Earth, the only one we have in our inventory to thrive and survive. How valuable would that be to humanity? I started, the artist in me and the dreamer started to get this idea. Why is it important to spend $10 million going into space when we need $10 million here on the ground? Um, that captured my attention and it, and it really gave me something very interesting slightly crazy to dig into and, and really start to work for. And that was a big turning point in my life, um, being disabled, starting on this fantastic project, and then gaining another chance at life through breakthrough biotechnologies and had my knees replaced and so forth. Um, so an extraordinary journey for me. And, and I think what Julian was saying about Aviation, people forget that aviation was developed primarily by two things, warfare and prizes. And, and the Ortega Prize, um, Peter was reading the book and going, oh, 17 spent $400,000 trying to win a $25,000 prize. So all of that money was leveraged into research and development for long distance air travel. And he got it. That's how we'll do space. Um, what a powerful motivator. So we'll come, we'll come back. Eric's story is really, really incredible, um, of hitting serious lows and losing his entire sense of identity and finding it again um, and rescuing the X Prize when it needed it most. So next, um, Mike Melville. Well, these two are two of my favorite people in the world. I have to say, Mike Melville uh, is a great study in pivoting and finding your passion and in taking big, big risks. So Mike uh, had a, pr he, as, as uh, Neil said, he was born in South Africa. He left high school uh, early because he was not challenged enough. He uh, ran away with his then girlfriend uh, with her father in hot pursuit. Um, and she is his wife now of 50-some years. 55. 55 years. An amazing love story. Um, and as they grew up together and the risks they took, they came to America. When he first started working as a carpenter in the UK. And they came to Indiana where his wife had, his wife's family had a machinist uh, tool-making right. company. Right. And so he taught himself carpentry, taught himself to be a machinist. And so talk about, you had this perfectly, you know, nice job, good paying job, security, family all around, and you leave it to go to a place called Mojave. How did that happen? Yeah, that's, uh, that was uh, the, the best thing I ever did in my life, I think. And at the time, it seemed pretty crazy to my family and uh, my wife's family, especially her family. <laughs> but, um, you know, what happened was that the company, where I was working in Indiana needed a pilot to go and troubleshoot the products we were selling. If something broke, you know, I'd, I'd jump on an airliner, fly as close as I could get to the company that had it, realize there was an airport right next door to there, and so when I came back, I told Sally's two brothers, who were, Sally and her two brothers and I were in business together in, in Indiana. And I told them, you know, one of us needs to get a pilot's license. 
because every place I go, there's an airport real close to that, but you've got to have a small airplane to get there. You can't go in an airliner. So they looked at each other and said, well, you used to ride a motorcycle, and we don't want to be pilots, so why don't you go? So they paid for me to get my private pilot, my commercial pilot, my instrument rating, and uh, I really fell in love with flying. I couldn't wait for somebody to break the equipment so I could fly over to New York or someplace to fix it. But you didn't uh, take to it right away. Either. Right, no, I, I, I had a heck of a time learning to fly. I got sick, I, I, my first logbook, the first page on my logbook, uh, the longest flight I took was 10 minutes and then I was throwing up. And finally my instructor realized that the thing to do was for him to take over have me open the door and throw up outside, and when I was recovered, then I'd continue on with a, a one-hour flight lesson. But I really did love to fly, and so what I did, I decided to build my own airplane because I couldn't afford the rental costs of an airplane. So I, uh, I went to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, where they have the EAA convention, Experimental Aircraft Association, and uh, I'd never seen him, never heard of him before, and I saw this guy selling little sets of plans to build your own airplane right out of the back of his airplane. And I liked the look of his airplane, so I paid $51 for a set of plans, took it home, and built the airplane. And because I was a machinist and a welder, I was able to do a lot of the stuff very quickly myself by uh, working weekends at the company because we were owners of the company. So, so that worked out really well, and pretty soon I had it ready to fly. And uh, I didn't really know the, the, the name of the guy. His name was Bert Rutan. He's a very famous aircraft designer now. And uh, he, you know, I was nervous to fly his airplane because everything is backwards about it. The tail's on the front, the engine's on the back, and it's, it, my instructor just simply wouldn't let me fly it. So I called up Mr. Rutan, asked him if I could come out there and be checked out by him and his prototype, which is what I did. He showed me all the good things about it and all the bad things about it. I came home and flew my airplane, and, and uh, it worked out very well for us. And so we were so proud of it, Sally helped me build it, my wife. And uh, so we both jumped in it one day and flew all the way to Mojave from Anderson, Indiana, which is a long flight. We got there, and Bert ran, ran out of his building because there was very little business on the Mojave Airport. It was just a desert airport with almost no activity there. And he came out and said, wow, that's the first one I've ever seen besides my prototype. Can I fly it? And I said, sure. You know, he, he obviously could fly his one. He should be able to fly mine. So he jumped in it, flew it around for about half an hour, did three landings and came back up and offered me a job. So uh, that's how, you know, by building, by buying that $51 set of plans, building the airplane, I got a job that uh, wound up and wound up becoming an astronaut. So a uh, very, very fortunate thing for me, and uh, it's been a, a, an incredible journey, really, it, it actually has. So, but <coughs> were your first impressions of Bert and the Mojave Desert, like what is this godforsaken place, and who is this crazy-looking character with the Elvis sideburns? And right. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I, I'd never, you know, Indiana is pretty green. <laughs> Mojave is not green. And when we flew over the mountains to Mojave, uh, I was really devastated. I'd never seen such <laughs> devastation that looked like the surface of the moon. And here came this guy with big sideburns, a really tall guy. And, uh, you know, he'd offered, he offered, us, offered me the job, and then he asked Sally what she did, and she uh, also got the job. So the whole company back in, in 1978 was Bert Rutan and Sally Melville and Mike Melville. And that company now is 630 people, and they uh, they do all kinds of interesting airplanes, including Spaceship Two, which was a follow-on program from Spaceship One. But um, Sally was really devastated by the the surroundings in Mojave. We actually lived in Mojave for two weeks, <laughs> and then uh, decided that wasn't going to work. So we moved to Tehachapi, which is a pretty reasonable place to live. And uh, that's where we live now. We have 20 acres up in the mountains at 5,200 feet. And uh, we, had, we had two boys. And um, we lost our oldest son. But our youngest son is still around. And he's got uh, two children as well. And they live not far from here. So uh, it's, been a, it's been an amazing effort, an amazing experience all the way through. 
but flying the spaceship was the culmination of my my career. I became a test pilot. Bert Rutan taught me what he needed to know, what he needed the pilot to do to be able to get information about how the plane flew. And so when he designed a new plane and I built it out in the shop, and he would tell me what he thought it would fly like, and, and so I would jump in it and do the first flight. I've done 10 first flights on one of a kind, never flown before, never been in a wind tunnel airplane, and uh, I've not, never, never failed to bring, one, bring them back. And uh, that, was a, that was a tremendous education for me, learning how to provide engineering data to the engineer who designed the airplane from what I felt flying the airplane. And apparently I was pretty good at that because uh, he insisted that I be the guy that did the first flight on Spaceship One and did the first flight to space. So Bert Rattan, just as a little bit of background, he uh, was this, you know, as a kid, he, and this is a great story for, for students to follow your passion, he was obsessed with airplanes and he, his family was Seventh, seventh Day Adventists. They were Seventh Day Adventists. And he was not allowed to see movies or do things on the weekends, but he always had his planes. And he would never build anything from a kit. He always wanted to build something that was one of a kind. He never, even as a kid, saw any point in building something that someone had already built, which proves uh, is consistent throughout his life. But develop this passion for airplanes as a child and never let go of it. His brother, Dick Rutan, became a very famous um, pilot and very decorated war pilot as well. And Bert really got a lot of fame in the 1980s, in 1986, when he designed uh, this spindly looking, again, improbable looking plane that was called the Voyager. And it was the first plane to fly non-stop, non-refueled around the world. It doubled the distance record held. It was an all-composite plane, so no metals. So he captured the world's attention with that, with his, his brother uh, and a woman named Gina Yeager flying that. And so did that... What was that like, Mike, just to be a part of that first history-making thing? And this gives you a lot of background to where we're going to go in a few minutes with the spaceship. Okay, yeah, I was involved very heavily with the Voyager. In fact, my wife and I both uh, helped Dick and Gina to build the airplane. I have flown the Voyager. I'm the only other person who ever flew it. Dick and Gina and I... Even Bert never got to fly it, but it was a very difficult plane to fly. It was a single point design. The only purpose of it was to fly around the world without stopping for gas. And uh, so it gave up creature comforts. The seating was terribly uncomfortable. Everything about it was was pointed at trying to make that distance, you know, which is a, an awful long way. I mean, 26,000 miles without refueling is, is almost impossible. You know, it carried an awful lot of gas and it took off from the longest runway at Edwards Air Force Base and used all but 1,000 feet. There was a 15,000 foot runway and it rolled 14,000 feet before it lifted off because it was so heavy. And then it staggered all the way around the world. And uh, I was the chase pilot when it took off. I flew right on his wing until, until about 300 miles off the coast. And then uh, we put and Sally and I turned back around and we couldn't even see the U.S. when we turned around. So we headed back and uh, then I was on the radio pretty much for, the, for a whole nine days. This, this trip took nine days for these two people. For nine days they were in this tiny little cockpit that it wasn't even comfortable for one person. And uh, one slept and one flew and they swapped. And uh, that, that airplane uh, was successful. It flew back into, landed right on the Edwards runway again nine days later. And we met it, Bert and I flew out at three o'clock in the morning, on, right down to San Diego here, just off the coast. Met with the airplane and guided it back to Mojave and watched it land in front of a crowd of some 100,000 people that had driven up from LA. It was a really amazing experience. And just this sense of doing the impossible. I mean, no one thought this was possible. How do you 
And wh what do you have to say about Bert and about the whole team and how that affected you for this next step that you would take that we'll talk about? Right. Right. It was, by most engineers, considered it to be an impossible task. You couldn't build an airplane that could carry enough gas to fly around the world. And the, the, the thing that made that possible was the was the invention or the discovery of a composite material called graphite or carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is very, very lightweight, and that the whole of the Voyager was made of carbon fiber. So it was extremely light, and it could carry nearly twice its own weight in fuel, which no airplane had ever done before and has never done since. So that was an amazing thing to have happen. But it did, it did give me some idea, that and other airplanes that Bert designed that we built, of what could be done and one day sitting in my office which was right across the hall from Bert's office we could see each other sitting at our desks he came in one morning all excited and he said I think I can I've got an idea for designing and coming up with a way for one of us to fly to space and I honestly thought poor old Bert had gone off the edge you know I just it never occurred to me that he was I thought he was kidding honestly I did I looked at him and he didn't look like he was kidding and uh, he was dead serious. He'd been thinking about it for six months or more, and he'd made a lot of sketches, and he showed me all the sketches. And, and I thought, wow, you know, if, if anybody can do it, maybe Bird can do it. But I honestly didn't think it could be done. I mean, think about it, <laughs> how hard it is to fly to space. I mean, only 450 people roughly have ever been to space and all the people in the world. I was the 433rd person to go to space and uh, only the second person to ever fly himself to space. Nobody else flew themselves to space other than Joe Walker. Joe Walker in the X-15 in 1960 flew himself to space. And uh, I, did, I repeated that in 2004. But all the rest of the astronauts in the world, the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, all of them, went up there with a computer flying the airplane and they did not fly themselves up there nor did they fly themselves back. But we had to do that because it had to be a pretty simple plane. There was no autopilot, there was no computer in there that handled the airplane. The pilot had to fly it all the way up and all the way down. So Eric, tell us at this point, you've gotten involved in the X Prize. you are starting to get your health mobility back again and kind of tell us about the early 2000s what was going on uh with the x prize and how you came to the rescue well this has been an extraordinary launch we we um as you mentioned the uh, 1996 we announced under the arch in st louis with all these astronauts and um the head of nasa and we had some really big gala parties for fundraising and we were raising money hand over fist we thought this is going to happen no problem um, tom clancy gave us hundred thousand dollars right on the spot it was it was amazing but the problem is this is like a 10-year prize it's going to take that long to get the the companies to you know build these spacecraft and we started losing momentum and um it's difficult to sustain a company if you don't have sort of continued momentum and money coming in much less raise the prize money we we announced it an unfunded prize and then we couldn't raise it and we slowly sort of lost people by attrition and finally i think in uh, 1999, we had half a person in the office. I was kind of working from home. Peter had gone off to California to do blast off, and um, it looked like the X Prize was dead. And 9/11 happened. Well, then I, yeah, I was actually building sculptures and selling them in the local farmer's market and furniture. And one of my customers asked me if I could do a Spirit of St. Louis. He said he was inspired by the, my grandfather's book, The Spirit of St. Louis. And it, it caused he and his brother to become pilots. And so many people have had that spark of a dream come from that book or another seminal um, you know, instance in their life. And, and he asked me to build the sculpture. And I building it in my shop thinking what would it be like if I could fly I have my life again I have my physical health I can walk and I can travel um, I can fly again could I do that flight and if I did could I 
do something good with it so that I could really understand my grandfather and help X Prize. So in 2000, we really decided to go for it and fly a small single engine air aircraft from New York to Paris on the anniversary of my grandfather's flight. And uh, it worked. I stayed alive, <laughs> flew for about 17 hours in a more modern but still small single engine aircraft from New York to Paris. And um, it, it really helped reinvigorate the extra. It raised a million dollars of cash, a million dollars of sort of in kind, and a half a billion media impressions uh, before social media. Um, hard to believe that was not that long ago, and there was no Facebook and <laughs> Google. Uh, but it, it really helped, you know. Make X Prize survive, and we found some sponsors, we found some donors, and and um, although we never actually raised the ten million dollar prize, I mentioned that. We'll just get to that. So, but you also had to, besides just making this crossing of the Atlantic flight, you had to embrace this legacy that you had always really been running away from. So I think it's an amazing story, lesson in life for how to kind of find yourself, claim your own identity, not necessarily what is expected of you or when there are no expectations. How, so how did you get to that point where you were brave enough to be who you wanted to be? Well, I mentioned that being a Lindbergh was actually a barrier to becoming a pilot. It, it wasn't until a friend of mine bugged me so much to go to a flight, demo flight, and I finally gave in to the, he was kind of pestering me. I took that flight with the pilot and I thought, oh, I like this. I want to become a pilot. And I, and I, and the, in the process of getting my pilot's license, I realized I could do what my flight instructor is doing and I kind of want to. I want to have a career in, in aviation, so I went on to become a commercial pilot and so forth. But that barrier of the Lindbergh thing was really tough. And I think, you know, so we all have different barriers. Sometimes the self-imposed ones are the worst. Um, but it wasn't until I realized, you know, I ran into some opposition from family members who said, you're going you're gonna to retrace the father's flight across the Atlantic? And they were upset. They were pissed. <laughs> it, and, and I realized... It was, it was sacred. You, you had no right to touch that? Or what kind of. Well, he, you know, he spent all of his life trying to move beyond that flight. It was the thing he was most famous for. So um, people would ask him about the flight, and he'd say, well, read the book. He, he needed to move beyond it because it, I guess, like a rock star with a famous hit, you don't want to play the hit all the time because you get sick of it. Um, so I ran into this real opposition with family, and I realized, you know, I kind of need to do this so that I can set myself free from this this legacy. And, and a, a big part of it was realizing that I didn't need to fill his shoes. The shoes were unfillable. He had like size 14s or something. But, <laughs> but I could walk in those footsteps. And allowing me to do that freed me of the burden of that legacy, and it allowed me to take advantage of it, and, and in that way, help change the world. It, it really was an extraordinary gift for me to, to, to break through that thing. And as a note to educators and, and students, you were a C-minus student in high school, and oh. you were an A-perfect 4.0 student in flight school. So. How oh, explain well, that. I'll, I'll tell you what. Mike has a similar story. I do. Well, you know, I think we, we often fail in, in education, and, the, and, and what happens is this. We're all different. We all have different skills and, and needs and um, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And our industrialized school systems of old, they're shifting now, thankfully, um, 
would, you know, put everybody butts in seats and, you know, you, this is what you learn and this is your homework. And I was just bored. And I, I tried to do my homework in class because, boy, when class was out, I had better things to do. So I got a C minus average. I'm not, I'd like to think I'm not slightly below average. <laughs> Intelligence. Uh, when I got to college, I had to pay for half of my tuition. I got B's. I had some more motivation going. I got to flight school and I got A's. And, it, and I'm not that good at math, but I, I did it because I wanted it so badly. And that taught me that, that intrinsic motivation is the most important factor in education. And kids can learn anything. If, if we give them that right spark and, and allow them to go after what their passion is, we can teach them all kinds of disciplines within that and, and outside of that. But through that, they will learn and you don't have to worry about them. In society, they will take care of themselves. Um, well, suddenly the math had a purpose. The math, you applied well, it to it. something. You applied sure. it to flying. No, it, it was it, not theoretical. It was not rote learning. It was what you needed to fly. Totally. And I, I, that was the motivation for me joining this small board of directors um, that wanted to start an aviation high school in Seattle called it Raised Back Aviation High School now. Um, and it was just. Aviation got me, and there was a big barrier, but if it gets other kids, we want them to learn through that aerospace lens, they'll learn that. So if we have a school for aviation, it's now the number one school in the state, incidentally. Um, but I think we have schools that teach music and focus on that, and can teach students around music and a well-rounded education, but focused on that, if kids have a passion for it, um, I think it's incredibly important. So how we do that, it's difficult. Education is incredibly difficult. And then there's government <laughs> that helps sort of with education uh, that, that make it incredibly difficult. But when that spark goes, we got to let those kids learn. we got to get out of their way and give them the tools they need. That's the key. So Mike, tell us your story as well of being completely unmotivated in school. Right. But you were a super competitive guy and right. a very smart kid. But I was. It wasn't motivating you. No, high school didn't motivate me at all, other than sports and uh, I, I became, I was a, a really good gymnast and a very good uh, target shooting guy. I won all kinds of things in that regard, but didn't do well with uh, high school education. And then when I went to work for Bert and saw some of the things he designed, and when he, especially when he got into the early stages of working how to do the spaceship, I began to realize that if you can dream something, you can do it if you just stick to it. And stick to itiveness is a really important thing. And uh, we did, you know, we stuck to that program, even though, I mean, the local people were laughing at us. Anybody who knew what we were doing thought we were silly because it takes a whole NASA to do this. And yet we were successful. Bert dreamed about it and we got it done. And I'm very proud of that fact. So by 2004, I want to get into this incredible part of this story. So the spaceship, this world's first private spaceship built by this team of 30, fewer than 30 engineers in the Mojave Desert, trying to do again what only the world's largest governments had done before. They've unveiled their spaceship to the public. Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, is their backer. Um, and they were going to, in front of tens of thousands of people who poured into Mojave, I've seen one of the pictures there where you see all the cars coming in, um, Mike Melville is chosen as the pilot. And it is June 21st, 2004, and Mike and his team from Scale, everything on the line, you know, again, tens of thousands of people there watching this. This is the first flight before the X Prize flights began. And here's Mike, who was 64 years old at the time, who was going to white knuckle it to space in this home built spacecraft. Amazing story, bravery, innovation. So, Mike, you want to talk just a little bit about that? And okay. there were anomalies too with every flight. This right. was serious risk taking. Right. Yeah. Every flight that I did in the spaceship, and I did 10 flights. 
three of them that went out of the atmosphere and two that went to space. On every flight we had problems, and sometimes pretty big problems, but um, we managed to overcome it. You know, we were talking to the ground, the, the guys that designed it, that actually fabricated each part were able to answer the questions that I had, you know, when I had something go wrong with the airplane. And I always managed to get it back in one piece, so. But it was a, it was a, absolutely, it was really a thrilling thing to do. I mean, it was mind-blowing how exciting it was. We, we built a, a mothership that carried us up to about close to 50,000 feet just like the X-15 did hanging underneath a, a B-52. We built our own B-52 that we called the White Knight um, and the spaceship hung underneath. When it got up there and they got up to enough speed, they dropped me off by pulling a lever in, in the, the mothership and I just fell from beneath the airplane, immediately lit the rocket motor and then pulled the nose up and headed straight up into the heavens. And it was a truly incredible experience because it was a bright sunny day every day when we took off from Mojave, that's how it looked. And as you got higher and higher, the, the sky gets darker and darker blue. And then all of a sudden, pretty quickly, it goes jet black, absolutely as black as ink. And uh, you can start seeing stars in the middle of the daytime. And for me, you know, I, I had actually had the instrument panel go bad on one flight. So I wasn't staring at the instrument panel, I was staring out of the windows and I actually watched the sky go from blue to black. And that, that was a, a mind-changing thing for me. I just couldn't believe that that, that actually happened. And, Why did you uh, take the risk? You know, it was just a challenge, it really was. Um, my wife was terrified, <laughs> she really was, but to her credit, she never once said she didn't want me to do it. And I really wanted to do it. And I was twice the age of any of the other pilots, more than twice the age. I mean, one of them was 28 and I was 64, so. Uh, Bert had faith in me because I had flown all of, all of his designs. While I worked for him, he did 40 different airplanes and I flew all of those, 10 of them the first flight. So I just thought this would be the, the, you know, the absolute culmination of my whole career and so I, I wanted to do it very badly and I did do it and I got my astronaut wings. And um, October, September 29th, 2004 was the first X-Prize flight, which Mike Melville also flew. October 4th, 2004 was the second X-Prize flight when this small team, small, scrappy, entrepreneurial team, uh, makes history, wins the $10 million X-Prize. Eric Lindbergh, it was a long, long journey. Mike Melville, it was... I would imagine the most rewarding, most unforgettable Absolutely. time one could ever experience. I guess people kind of hearken it to the, the magic of the of the Apollo days, and it was right there in, in Mojave. It was. The Mojave Airport now is called the Mojave Spaceport, <laughs> and it really is a spaceport. There are people there developing spacecraft that are going to follow in our footsteps. Well, um, I just want to ask one question of my own, if I may. So both of you distinguished gentlemen have now been interviewed for the book. You have read the book, and you've given presentations like this for the book. I'm curious, what's been the most exciting moment for each of you with relation to the book? What would you say is the one standout moment that you had to describe us? <laughs> For me, reading this book was kind of extraordinary because it, it details what we did, but most of it isn't the part that I experienced. So having been, had been a direct participant, it was extraordinary to read that again and have the depth and detail and, and, and the poignancy of the words, the prose, blew me away. But learning things about Mike and about what was actually happening, you know, we thought, oh, it was a successful flight. We had no idea about the depth of the problem. And the near death flight. <laughs> so that was a huge gift from really the telling of this story that, that just came, you know, a decade after later. Eric, thank you for that very much. And Mike, what would you say was the one standout moment for you in this entire experience? 
the book experience, well, I really enjoyed meeting Julian, of course, and we, together, we spend a lot of time together. And she's very crafty. She asks you all kinds of questions. And, and what amazed me was I read the book, and it was exactly what I had told her, pretty much. I mean, I don't think I said she didn't quote one word that wasn't mine. And I've never been in a book before, so that was pretty wow. thrilling for me. <laughs> With all your accomplishments, then, that's interesting. Right. And so, Julian, I want to ask you yourself, because you have another perspective on this, don't you? But of all of those chapters, what would you say are some of the most memorable moments that stood out that people would like to know about? Well, I mean, there are perks to the job, you know, look at who I get to hang out with. But I did get to go flying with Mike Melville in his Long Easy, and uh, we did a few, you know, roles, and uh, no, that was great. No, it's really the quality of the individuals who I got to interview and that I get to tell their story, and I look at the book, we're all trying to make some difference in this world, right, whether in the lives of students, um, a little piece of immortality that we try to leave. And for me, it's my books, and they're the stories that I get to tell. And I get to keep this story, which embodies the best of the human spirit, alive. And I get to, you know, meet Bert Rattan and Mike Melville and Eric Lindbergh and tie in these great stories of history and make it thoroughly modern. So it was all an amazing experience, and I'm so proud of the story that I got to tell. I think it's um, because it is inspirational. I mean, these are the people who should be the mentors in our society today. These are our role models, and you know, I didn't set out to create a book uh, about role models. I set out to tell a story that I thought was really compelling. But as I see it now, these are you know, our modern day um, heroes, people who should be brought to the attention of students of people of all ages. So it was a really privileged, uh, it's a privilege to be able to do it. The reporting was, uh, was great fun. The writing was a huge challenge. It is rocket science but it was always character driven. It was always about the people and their drama, their dreams, the tribulations, and where did they end up in the story. And the book is a true story. I think that's what impressed me about it. It's exactly what happened, how it happened, why it happened, all the difficulties are there, and all the success are there. And it's, I, I think Julian's done a wonderful job with the book. Thank you. So it, it shouldn't have happened. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> we made it work. It's a story right. that shouldn't have happened, right? That's right. So, I think we've uh, gathered some lessons here today. One of the great hallmarks of leadership is that there are actually many, and I think it's a lot of little things that add up to a big thing. But certainly, part of that is innovation, determination, and humility, sacrifice. I think you've all demonstrated that abundantly, all three of you. So, I personally want to thank you for being here. And on behalf of all the many groups, science education groups, the teachers groups that are listening today, can we give them a great, great big round of applause? Thank you. For, for everybody listening online and watching online and also in the audience, this, as you've heard, is just a piece of the story. And so it's important for you to now, if you are sufficiently intrigued, if, to know about how to get a hold of a copy of your book. And one way to do that is simply right now, if you can, go to Amazon online, go to your Barnes & Noble bookseller, and you can do that online or offline, but get a copy of the book while they're in stores, because they won't be there for long with so many people who are interested in this great story. And by the way, it's not only a New York Times bestseller, it's been on the bestseller list for many, many weeks. There's a very, very big demand for this book. And let your Barnes & Noble booksellers know if for some strange reason they don't have enough in stock to order more, because it's really a story that's timeless, it's perennial, inspiring, and it's something you can not only enjoy, but pass over to your children and your relatives and your friends. So again, thank you, everybody. I'd like to just now follow up with just a few questions. I think we'll probably take, how many questions will we take, Julian? Four or five questions? I think four. Four questions, okay. So I'm going to come back down there in the audience. And for those of you who would like to ask a question of any of the panelists, could you raise your hands? Great. There's a familiar face. 
This is local. May you introduce yourself to the audience who's online? Yes, absolutely. This is Khalid Sparkly Bird. Oh, okay. Oh, God. You're going to have to. Is it? Is it? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> the seats are a little low and hard to get up. Um, I'm Halise Sparky Bridges. I'm founder of Ignite What's Right, and we focus on what's working in the world and be the spark that changes the world. I have a couple questions. One is, will you repeat the name of your book and the author again so that we all hear it and can repeat it? That's my first question. Did you do that? Um, Julian Guthrie, so I'm the author. And it's called How to Make a Spaceship, A Band of Renegades, An Epic Race, and the Birth of Private Space Flight. And it has a foreword by Richard Branson and an afterword by Stephen Hawking. So I really appreciate that because I, my question is that when our rocket ship goes to the moon before this, before this, before this uh, what you just flew, uh, there was booster rockets that got them up into outer space. How did you get into outer, how did you take your vehicle out to outer space and what was the fuel that was used? How, how do we do it? How much time did it take? And how many miles is it to outer space? That's my question. Thank you. Okay, well the edge of space internationally is known as being 100 kilometers or 62 miles above sea level. And uh, you know, nobody, light air, any airplanes cannot fly that high. The, the highest airplane is uh, just a tenth of that altitude. So um, the rocket fuel, well, the, the oxidizer was liquid nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas when you go to the dentist, but it's in a liquid form. Uh, when you're in the dentist, it's a gaseous form. And the fuel was rubber, the same material that the tires on your car are made out of in the rocket motor and we had to because we couldn't use any government money if you were going to win the x prize the 10 million dollars you had to do it with private money and not any government assistance no gov government financial assistance so we came up we we met a guy who was a model rocket guy and the model rocket people use rubber and liquid nitrous oxide and so that's what we did we hired a model guy who had the biggest rocket motor he ever built was the size of a beer can and he didn't see why we couldn't make one that was 15 feet long and two feet in diameter and had 18,000 pounds of thrust. So <laughs> um, that's exactly how we did it. And we hired him, and he was not a government worker, so he designed it for us with a lot of help from Bert Rutan. It took us two and a half years to develop the rocket motor into what it turned out to be, a very reliable rocket motor. But uh, initially it was a lot of trouble. Building rocket motors is not an easy thing. But we didn't try to go from the ground like NASA does. NASA goes from the ground all the way to space. That's very, very expensive and throws away a lot of hardware. You lose the whole, the whole system that carries you up there. Uh, so we used an airplane, a jet-powered airplane, to carry us to 50,000 feet and drop us off. Then as a glider, we'd light the rocket motor and turn the airplane and shoot up into space using the rocket motor on the little airplane called Spaceship One. And so it was a, a hand-flown thing. You used your hands and your feet on the rudders, and you flew it with, with a lot of difficulty. It was not an easy plane to fly. Um, and you, you'd find yourself going off in all different directions, but the main thing is you wanted to go straight up. And so we got as high as uh, 64 miles. I got as high as 64 miles. And so, and Brian, who flew the second flight, went to a little higher than that even and so we we did we had to do two flights in the space of two weeks to win the x prize and we had to use the same vehicle to do that and and we did that and we won the money and uh, paul allen got the 10 million and he shared five million dollars with the com our company bert rutan's company and bert shared two million of that with all the employees so we had employees that sweep the floor that got a one-year salary in one bonus, and that included me as well. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> so um, we're running short of time. We have about five minutes left. Three more questions I'd like to get from the audience. And before I do that, I want to... Uh, do you have a book for me? Mm -hmm. Okay. You're surprised, Skip's here. 
Sparky, is that you actually get an autographed copy of How to Make a Spaceship. And each one, each sequential person here who asks three more questions will also, uh, based on thankfully from Jillian being very gracious, she's going to offer these books for you as well. To save a little time, I'm going to come down now in the audience. I'm going to give you your book. And for anyone else who has a question, I'll be delighted to do that. And then finally, just so you all know, there's going to be a very special treat. Something very, very special is going to be offered at the end of this. And uh, you all want to stick around for that, including those of you online. Here you go, sir. Thank you. Our pleasure. Hi. You look familiar. What's your name? Michelle. Michelle? What is your question? Oh, okay. Great. Oh, okay. So my question is, um, I just forgot my question. If you had to remember it, what would it look like? Can I actually acknowledge the panelists for... You could do anything you'd like with your time. And that will actually help me remember my question. Um, I just want to say that I really admire ingenuity and the innovation that, and the creativity that came through everything that you've gone through, um, starting from creating a contest to you know, in, inventing something as huge as this and then influencing a lot of people to help support. So I really admire that and I, I love sharing this with the students that we work with as well as the leaders and the CEOs that we work with as well. So my question for you is, now that you've done this, now that you have the book, what's next? And if I just may, for the interest of time, if we can try to keep that to about, you know, half a minute to a minute and natural, we greatly appreciate it. Was that for each of us? Okay. Well, for me, I retired after that, so now I'm just sort of bumming around. And uh, I, I've, I've got a little homemade plane that I, I took Julian for a ride in, and that's what I use. I actually flew it all the way around the world uh, some years ago. And so uh, as a retired person, I'm just enjoying, literally enjoying being retired. We have another book. Thank you very much. So I, I would just say that um, it was incredibly empowering to be a part of a small team of people who changed the way the world thinks about space flight. Seeing Spaceship One hanging in the Air and Space Museum next to the Spirit of St. Louis, um, it empowered us. And we all sort of think, oh, how do we do that again? I'm, I'm not a rocket scientist, so <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pilot, and I love flying. I thought, well, what are the problems facing aviation? We, we burn fuel, we make noise, we broadcast it over large areas. Um, how do we solve those issues? So I've turned my sights to electric propulsion and um, working on several initiatives. One is saving the elephants in Africa using electric drones. We've got a personal air vehicle drone. Um, you can see it at airshepherd.com uh, or .org. Um, we've got a personal air vehicle under uh, development at Embry Real Aeronautical University and a two seat all electric E Spirit of St. Louis that will be flying next year on the 90th anniversary and a hybrid electric program that will scale to about a nine seat aircraft. Um, so that's my sort of what next. Thank you. Thank you both of you. Excellent answers. Now do I have another question? Somebody yes sir. Would you please stand up and give us your name? Hi, I'm Doug Kriedeman. I'm the principal here at El Camino High School. So I just want to acknowledge, Julian, it's the Thursday before Super Bowl Sunday. These are heroes. Yes. And we get so wrapped up in what the media tells us and just, it, these are heroes right here in front of us. And I want our students, one of the things that Stedman said earlier, passion, purpose, love. We at, Ocean, or at El Camino High School in the district Oceanside Unified, we really believe in this idea of hearts, hands, and minds. And we've, we've lost some of that, and we're trying to bring that back. That idea of you're a machinist, but that passion and love for that, that's our hands and minds. And we're so excited. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, my question is, how can we build a plane here at El Camino High School? Good, good question. <laughs> yeah, excellent question. We have, uh, unfortunately, just like one or two minutes left, but if you can answer yeah, that succinctly, yeah, it would be appreciated. Yeah, there, there, there is actually a, uh, a nonprofit called Build a Plane that um, helps schools to actually build airplanes and there are mentors in the community that you can reach out to so that's absolutely possible and a great learning environment and i love that heart hand love that was 
Heart, hands, mind. That's beautiful. I love that. We'll have to sign the books with that. It's a great, great mantra, great approach. Congratulations on that. Wonderful. Can I have one of the All right, we're going to have one final question, and then we're going to have a special prize. Okay, discuss in just another moment. I see a lot of hands in the audience. Now they know, folks, that uh, there's something special being awarded here. And I hope, again, you'll go to your favorite bookseller and order How to Make a Spaceship by Julian Guthrie. Yes, sir. Would you give us your name, please? Right over here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bob Perro. I'm an electrical engineer and a pilot. So could you give us an idea of what's involved, or perspective on what's involved in um, the commercialization, to production, and the timing of the real world. You're asking when will people be able to go to space in one of these commercial vehicles, SpaceX, Blue Origin, or Virgin Galactic? Mike, do you have any insights on that? Yeah, or? I, I do. You know, um, Richard Branson, Sir Richard Branson, has been trying to duplicate what we did in Spaceship One for several years now with Spaceship Two. And sadly, they had an accident uh, two years ago, which took out my best friend. He was in it. And so that has set them back quite a bit. But they're back in the air now. They've made two two flights with their new Spaceship Two, and it'll it'll it has a capable. It has eight seats in it, two pilots and six passengers, and he's got uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand people who have put money down to buy tickets to go to space. And Sir Richard Branson is bound and determined to give all those people a ride to space. And uh, I'm here to tell you that it would be a lot of fun to do that. <laughs> Having done it twice myself, um, I love doing that. And uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX team, right. they are going to be flying, uh, they have a private public partnership, partnership with the government to take astronauts, NASA astronauts, to the International Space Station um, as early as next year. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, uh, also is another great space geek, he's in the book. Um, he has started Blue Origin, and they are also doing suborbital flight, which is this 62 miles, 100 kilometers to the start of space. They aren't doing, they haven't flown people yet, but that is on the horizon. That is, uh, and not so far off. So this is really the most promising time in history uh, for these things to be happening. There, it's it's eminent. Right, right. Both of those, both of those guys are probably going to be doing something by the end of this year, I would think. Certainly, uh, Richard is going to be doing that. They're pushing very hard right now. It, we didn't just set out to build a spaceship to do something that was done 30 years earlier. We set out to build a launch industry, and it worked. And those guys are doing it now. These leading visionaries of our time are spending private money to do it. Partnerships with government when able. Um, it's an extraordinary time in history. Can we get a big, big round of applause for three extraordinary visionaries? Did you enjoy that? All right. Now, before you all go, we're going to, I say we have a special, special announcement. We're getting a standing open. Thank you. Thank you. Please. So I want to thank the three of you. I know that you made a sacrifice today and a long journey to be here, and we appreciate it. I know that everyone online has been watching who appreciates it. And I want to thank everybody in the audience for being a very, very special guest here today. We really appreciate that. So you're, you can all take your seats for one final quick moment. Um, we have a special announcement to make, and I will let Julian... I guess if you'd like to consult with your three distinguished panelists, this is going to be very difficult, and I don't want to stay out of the politics, but uh, I've asked Julian to huddle with her three illustrious panelists here to decide who they think asked the best question today, mm -hmm. and if you could answer that. Uh, okay, so we will pose a question. So who knows two reasons why October 4th is an important date in the history of space. Okay, did everyone get that? Tony Materna. No Googling. Were you able to 
year. I don't think I don't think so. Not on October four. October four. No. Okay. Okay. We can come. We can come up with different <laughs> questions. Uh, the answer to that was that was when um, the X Prize was won and also uh, the anniversary of Sputnik. October fourth. Um, okay. So next question. Let's see. Um, So, so the, the, the rules were you had to fly the equal weight and mass of three people, um, a pilot and two passengers, right? Mm -hmm. So you only flew solo, right? Right. What did you carry on the spaceship to <laughs> equal the weight and mass, the mass of three right. people? Right, because the spaceship one had three seats in it. But the FAA would, uh, wouldn't would allow anybody else to go. Bert actually, Bert Rutan actually got in with me and locked the door and was determined to go with me. And the FAA came over and banged on the door and took him out. So, so we didn't get to carry anybody on the very first flight. But on the second flight, we filled the back seats. We made a fiberglass copy of almost of a person's torso and legs. And... Uh, had a, a lid on the top and so half all the people who worked at scaled composites put all their tools in there they put their wedding bands in there they put all kinds of artifacts that they wanted to be able to say to somebody hey my wedding band went to space on this flight and uh, i think we had something like 250 wedding bands carried up into space and lots and other things were carried too tools and in, some, in my case, I don't. You ha, each person or each seat had to carry 200 pounds. I'm only 160 pounds, so I had lead shot in my in my pockets of my flight suit to bring me up to 200 pounds. All right. Well, okay, so, so we, we do, we do have one yes, one time. thing to give away. Yeah. And again, what was your idea in terms of how? Well, as we discussed it, you know, I didn't want to get into the politics, but I thought perhaps if you let us and figured out who asked the most interesting question of today, they could also be entered in this competition that narrows down to the finalists. And uh, again, you know, this is this is your decision. Or does anyone want to take a guess as to what we have that flew on that winning X Prize flight? It uh, is very small. It is something that uh, we use every day. Coins. Wait, did someone take an issue? <laughs> I like that. You know, I. You know what I would like to do. Sure, sure. If, so I would like to um, give this to the principal. I think that's a very appropriate, appropriate decision. So this, this is a. They were pennies that were flown as ballast, and there were I don't know how many, but it's a, something very rare. Um, they are individually wrapped and they were flown by um, the team from Microsoft. So there's a card that goes with it. They're not for resale, these things, they cannot be bought. Um, it's something that I hope just reminds you and inspires you in your job, um, reminds you of bravery and of doing the impossible, that the impossible is possible. That's what this should represent. So I hope it inspires you. This is very, very, very special and very collectible, and I'm very honored to present it to you. And Julian, it was an excellent choice. So here you are, sir. This is, of course, not for resale. It's to be passed on to uh, special people down the road in your life. There you go. My pleasure. Thank you very, very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our uh, our presentation today. And I want to thank everybody listening online. And once again, the book is How to Make a Spaceship by Julian Guthrie. 
and ask for it now online in your favorite bookstores. We appreciate your joining us. We appreciate everybody being here. Say a few moments, please. Say hello to our panelists. And if for some reason there's not an autograph in your book, by some mistake, please present it to the panelists. We'll make sure that you're taken care of. Thank you again for joining us. I also want to thank our technical crew. I want to thank um, Richard Crawford, producer five, and uh, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Michelle Price for her wonderful work. And for mine. I want to thank our technical crew. I want to thank everybody here, and uh, we'll see you next time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.